Hi again, everybody. Welcome into another edition, a brand new episode. This is Cross Functionality, the show connecting coaching, baseball, softball, male, female, hosted by former college baseball and softball players. As we dive into episode 42 today, facing a tough pitcher, that's our main topic. So let me bring in my friend, co-host, softball national champion at the University of Alabama and current day renowned coach, Cassie Riley Bosha. Hi, Cass. How's it going? <laughs> it looks good yesterday in the reds i saw yesterday on instagram and the mm. red Sox, red and white yes so super cool opportunity to coach at fenway uh college league cape cod league doing a scrimmage at fenway um drove three hours out there got to hang out with guys for about an hour during a lightning delay only for us to say for them to say <laughs> hey we're canceled um <laughs> But very cool to, you know, be on the field. Uh, it's certainly been very cool to see what the knowledge of hitting and the game of softball has opened up doors for in baseball as well. So very cool opportunity. You know, you talked a couple of weeks ago about women's sports and softball in particular getting as big as it has. And I, I saw this morning a clip on Twitter um, of a couple of Oklahoma players at a press conference a table style that you'd see like in the nba after like an nba finals game or something or an nba mm -hmm. playoff game or something like that and just the little things like that with multiple girls at that press table getting interviewed by and uh, in post game those post game interviews by the media and i to your point too from a few weeks back talking about women's sports and softball i saw last week and i think it was uh, the women's college one of the uh, one of the championship games was on abc it was on actual cable television which you would think 10 years ago that was somewhat unheard of and maybe it was on abc 10 years ago but 20 years ago it certainly was unheard of and now women's sports has um, certainly been able to canvas multiple platforms with all of their sports not just softball so pretty cool to see it's incredible. I think in the last two or three years, there's been sprinkles of games on ABC every now and then, um, certainly for the last few years. And, and this is partially because baseball has a professional league. Softball really doesn't. But softball viewership has outweighed the baseball college side. And that was a shift that happened in the last three or four years. So, you know, it's just it's great to see. It's awesome for females, especially now that that name, image and likeness can happen at the collegiate level, because previously, if they, you know, they'd have their most fandom and stardom essentially happening at that collegiate level yeah. and then you know never be able to have anything come of it and it's been very cool to see some females setting themselves up financially as they start uh their careers whether they decide to be in softball or not yeah and congratulations to all the girls who picked up some postseason accolades montana fouts was of mm -hmm. course one of those people she picked what it was the i forget what it was because pat uh, pat murphy posted on his instagram story a congratulatory post she was uh, nsca yeah, all-american and then that's what it was also academic all-american yeah um yeah. so congratulations yeah, to her season time is cool i'm sad because it's over <laughs> it's, yeah i feel like it's a dark time uh until you get you know baseball playoffs and and college football back not that regular season baseball isn't as is, is fun but college i mean uh playoff baseball is it's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, hey, look, I agree, but and I've said this before. Once you go to an extra playoff team, and I know that there's a lot of money involved in that, but once you go to that extra playoff team in baseball, those games in April and May don't mean as much because mm -hmm. you can go on a run mm -hmm. in June and then et cetera, et cetera, and here you are in the postseason, even though you probably don't deserve it. Anyway, so I get the <laughs> point there. College football, right around the corner. I was reading something about uh, Nick Saban um, earlier this week about his work schedule and how his, his coaches work pretty much seven days a week all year around because they have mm. so much that now with the new technology and social media and all these recruiting services and and the likeness and image for these players that they have to present these opportunities those certain opportunities now to those players and it, the coaches have to work seven days a week they work almost every week of the year seven days a week which is incredible the role of a college coach has has changed certainly dramatically i would think in all sports with all the new stuff that's involved it now is in hard. NCAA. it is so hard i look at my coaches and i'm so thankful for them but it is so hard and yeah. i credit everybody at all levels it's not that it gets easier at the higher levels and it doesn't get easier at the lower levels it is it is hard at all levels yeah. for sure um, so today we're talking about facing a challenging pitcher, episode 42. We're going to be talking about communication, dialing in. We're going to be talking about spotting up the ball, which a lot of people don't really talk about when um, discussing facing that tough pitcher. On the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast this week, we did episode 143, and we talked about facing an ace, volume two, which was mm. um, a lot of fun. And we talked about how to create a plan and an approach with Sandy Alcantara. And a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today is very similar 
to facing an ace like a Sandy Alcantara of the Miami Marlins and talking about celebrating details and understanding that certain pitcher out there on the mound. I think it all comes down to the first thing is the approach mm. that a certain approach that you may have baseball or softball when you're facing that really challenging pitcher on the mound and somebody who can mow you down, say, or anybody really say 12, 13, 14 hitters, 14 of the last 15 hitters in that, in that row, in that trend. So facing a challenging pitcher, it all starts with having that approach. For sure. And I would say something too. It, it, softball is is moving a little further away from it, I think, just because hitting is getting better and pitching is becoming a little bit more demanding. But you go into a championship series at the Women's College World Series finals and you're probably facing the same pitcher all three games. There's, you know, and that's unheard of in baseball. It's you face that ace, you know, depending on where they, they put them or the, a team has two aces. Um, but when that's the case, um, we've always used to talk about Listen, pitchers, especially in softball, rise balls can be utilized. There's a ball that is going to fly out of the zone. Um, a really good baseball pitcher is going to throw some of his best pitches that look like they're going to be a strike, but they end up out of the zone, right? So they, they end up hitless pitches. And so many times they want our eye to get to get used to following those pitches out of the zone because it's really going to trip us up for when that pitch in the zone happens. So um, if you can start to have those types of approaches where – you're talking to the catcher. You're saying, hey, where's the umpire calling this on? You're talking to your teammates and saying, what is she throwing on on when she's ahead? What is she throwing when she's behind? Uh, what's what's she throwing on that first pitch strike? Or really, how can I carve out the strike zone and say, you know what? I've watched film. Once every batter, she throws a pretty good strike here. And this is where I'm focused. And I'm not focusing on that ball that flies out of the zone. I'm not focused on the ball that drops in the dirt. I'm aware of it, but this is this is the spot. This ball comes hard here. That's the curveball I'm hitting or the screwball I'm hitting. Mm -hmm. And if we can start to really study these pitchers and study these approaches, similar to how we would approach, gosh, we study more for tests in school than we do sometimes pitchers well, that we're about to face. I don't, I don't know about uh, that, but okay. <laughs> well, meaning I think people kind of just go up there and say, okay, like I'm just going to see it and hit it. Or I'm, you know, mm -hmm. um, all those things are, are important for sure. Well, so I got to ask you, though, when it comes to hitting an ace in, in softball, obviously baseball is a lot different. When it comes to softball, though, you're facing, you mentioned a girl maybe two, three times in a row. How does your approach change from game to game like that? What what kind of tinkering do you do to that approach that now makes it easier when you're facing that pitcher? it's, you know, it's sitting down, having conversations, even like um, those post-game discussions over dinner. I remember we played Oklahoma in, in our finals and we've played national player of the year, a really strong lefty, hard throwing girl with a ton of movement. And we lose that first game and we're sitting there talking and we're saying, okay, guess what? Staying back in the box didn't work. The ball moves way too much. We got to come up in the box. Okay. So we're up in the box facing 72, 73. What does that mean? You know, we need to probably, we might not be using our 34s. We might be using a 33-inch bat. We might be using a shorter bat, or maybe we're choking up a bit. We're not doing our big load. We're getting a little bit of a wider stance to get a sh shorter load, short approach to the ball because not only is she throwing hard, we're now up in the box, right? So just little things like that, little conversations where you're trying to strategically interpret what worked, what didn't work, um, knowing, hey, listen, this pitcher got extremely uncomfortable when we crowded the plate. Um, and so you're – studying the film, talking to coaches who have been there more rounds of it than you have, and then figuring out your approach. That's going to say, okay, this is, this is our best guess approach for what's going to work for the next game. Um, and I think what's important too, is it worked for us in game two. We won game two, we came back in game three and that pitcher struck out the first nine batters. We had to adjust yet again. So being able to scrap a plan and not stick with it for too long, but then also realize, you know, something I had talked about before is really wearing a pitcher down. And how important that is. If you're facing her one, two, three times in a row, you have to start to understand, hey, you might strike out, but it, you had a 10 pitch at bat. That is such a huge at bat because someone else down the line is now going to find success because we, we just wore her down a little bit more here. Um, so things like that add up. Those little tiny victories matter. You know, when you talk about just kind of chipping away at a pitcher, I've said this before, and I talked about it this week on the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast. We've talked about it. We've said it. You have about seven to eight pitches per game that you're going to get that you can do damage with. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a pitch right down the middle. If you're not looking for that pitch in your approach right down the middle and you take it, that's a good thing because if you swing, you're probably not going to hit it as hard as you may want to or do as much damage as you see fit. If you're looking for a breaking ball, 
and you do damage with that breaking ball, that could count as one of those those seven to eight pitches that you get per per game that you can really do damage with. It's no obviously no different in softball, and that's where your approach changes. And I think that's where you can kind of chip away a little bit too as a hitter when you talk about facing that tough pitcher because it is a grind facing that that tough pitcher one two three days in a row. It's no walk in the park, so to speak. It's no it's not fun. But ways that you can counter that is by having that that proper approach and understanding that that approach has to be interchangeable if you're going to have success. Right. And I think some people listening to this would be like, you'll you, like you should never uh, heed to a pitcher like this. You should never like pitches down the middle. You should always crush. I, th- what I say to that is you've never been challenged to the point where you have to tip your hat to the pitcher and say, I can't just do that anymore. I have to have a plan or approach in order to find success over off of you right now, because this is such a challenging pitcher. So I think these instances, it's not your average pitcher that you're facing. You're facing one of the best in the league, the one of the best you've ever seen, the fastest you've ever seen, the best movement you've ever seen, whatever it may be. And then you have to say to yourself, okay, it is worth taking that hard pitch, let's say, because I know she throws this change up or this curveball or whatever it is one, t- once every at bat to every lefty, whatever it is, and I'm sitting on that one speed. So if you're sitting on that one speed because that's the one you want and she maybe makes that mistake and it's a hard outside pitch and people are like, oh, why didn't you swing at that? It's like, listen, like I had to tip my cap. Uh, yes. Does it put me susceptible to some things like that? Maybe. But I'm putting my, I'm giving myself my best chance of success for the one I'm actually sitting on and looking for. Yeah, and you talk about communication too, and these are conversations that you're supposed to have as players in the dugout, and you're supposed to have before you go out into the on-deck circle. It's all part of that approach, and it helps you understand too what might be coming in an 0-1 count, might, what might be coming in a 3-1 or a 2-2 type count, and it's part of that chipping away process. And communication, it, it it's all kind of weaved into one big thing, which is that that approach. Yeah. Watching a game from afar, even if you've been there, like if anything, players who are sitting in the stands, players who are watching at home, they know when they see a girl take a pitch, they're not like, oh, you should have swung at that. They're like, I wonder if that pitch looked a completely different way, because that's what pitchers are trying to do. They're trying to make the pitch that just went over your head look the exact same as the pitch that now just got piped down the middle. Right. It looks the same out of her hand. The spin looks the same. The approach looks the same. And here you think you're making an adjustment, taking a pitch that's going to end up over your head and it stays flat. So so many times having conversations with the batter and she'll be like, yeah, listen, that ball looked like it was coming in and it ended up over here. That ball looked like it was going to be low. It ended up staying there. Um, even something as simple as you can catch spin and you're communicating about spin to your teammates. Um, it's, you know, we had a concept going back to that national championship game where we were going to celebrate the details because like I said, you know, you're in a, you're in a back against the wall type game and you have your pitchers, or your hitters strike out one through nine to start the first three innings. Mm -hmm. If we just kind of got consumed by the outcome of every single at bat, we would have been in a very emotional hole come that third inning. When you're Mm -hmm. facing these challenging pitchers, it's every ball you take, every time you foul a pitch off, you know, and it's how valuable it is knowing your hitters plan. You know, that hitter is sitting on the off-speed pitch and she takes the hard one. Who cares Mm -hmm. if it's a strike? We celebrate that. And now our focus is on us. It's on our team. It's on the small time any pr- progress that we're making pitch by pitch. And, uh, and that's what leads to those bigger innings and those bigger at bats. It gives you the chance for those instead of just getting drained by the failure, failure, failure. That is, you know, the perceived outcome of every at bat. Yeah, well, so by the way, when you're watching games now, do you mm-hmm. still try to think along with the pitcher? Like oh, I do, like yeah. oh, when, I, when you're, for yeah. sure. I mean, you never lose like, that. Do you? <laughs> yeah. I think that's part of the fun of it. I think, yeah. you know, and I think that's why people who are baseball, softball junkies, They'll watch a game and, and, you know, someone who's like only into football or faster moving games, they'll be like, oh, this is so boring. Meanwhile, our brain is going a million miles a minute. We're like, man, if this was pitch was coming in, how would I stand? Would I be on the plate? Would I be off the plate? <laughs> you right, know, right. Would I choke up? Would I split grip? Maybe this would happen. Yeah. So we're yeah. providing that nonstop feedback from watching games just because our brain is at a completely different uh, perspective when we watch. <laughs> right. What do they always, what do they always say? What's that old saying that baseball, I don't even, I don't know, baseball, baseball and softballs for I don't know, people who understand or something like that. I don't know know that old saying, but yeah, it's such, there's so many intricacies that I think if people understood more about both games, then they would really enjoy. Some people wouldn't because they just don't want to think and they want that mindless. I don't want to say that. I don't want to say any other sport is mindless, but they, they, they want the faster moving game where they don't have to think too much and they can just sort of watch and, and kind of enjoy 
the brilliance uh, that's going on in front of them. But with baseball and softball, there is the, it's a thinking man's game. It's mm. a thinking woman's game. And, and you have to understand that if you really want to get enjoyment out of watching that, you, then you might have to watch the little things. You might have to really pay attention to some of those little fundamentals that those top notch baseball, top level athletes, softball are doing at that given moment. For sure. And you know what, what's exciting for me too, is I'm, I'm watching, I'm, I'm 11 years out playing. So there's not a single girl playing right now that I played against. However, Mm -hmm. that pitching coach for Oklahoma was Florida's pitching coach when I played and I had Mm -hmm. to face her a ton. So it's, it's neat because I'm watching a lefty hitter for Florida state facing Oklahoma right now. And I'm like, I wonder if she still has the same like seat, like, you know what I mean? It's just, it's neat to still see so many of the same coaches in the game. Um, And listen, it's, it's, you know, any softball play, former player, anyone who's into softball, it's like the college world series time. June is May and June is just this, like, it's our heaven for our sport. Right. And oh, the yeah. conversations on Twitter are, are smarter, more intelligent. People are starting to understand these intricacies on a deeper level. People are sharing these intricacies on a deeper level. And I just think the conversation surrounding uh, baseball and softball has just been so intelligent and so entertaining uh, to yeah. follow. Unless you're on hitting Twitter, of course, and then oh, it becomes no, toxic. You need to de- de- get your algorithm out of that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, so we're talking today again, facing a challenging pitcher, episode 42. Um, let's talk a little bit about spotting up the ball and what that means more for softball, but also how it correlates to baseball as well when you're facing that tough pitcher. Sure. So... Um, I, I give the example of a rise ball pitcher because I think this was really the scenario where it worked the most. So you have a rise ball pitcher in softball, even if that pitch doesn't skip or jump as much as what you might have seen at the World Series, you still face girls with high spin rates, high velocity. And because it's coming out from their waist and ending up closer to your chin or the t- even just the top of the strike zone, you're in a position now where you, it's very similar to a baseball guy throwing high spin rate, top of the zone. Um, it has that perceived rise lift to it. And, it, you know, you'll know someone is really doing that because you see a lot of people looking really late and swinging and missing either underneath um, that high pitch. They're recognizing it late um, or they're popping up or, you know, they think they're hitting the middle of the ball. They're getting underneath it. They're hitting fly ball. So what we talked about is, OK, we, we have this softball coming in and we can just we can either just decide to look at the whole ball or we can dial in and be like, I'm going to look at the top half of the ball. So now if that ball does move, I'm seeing it maybe just a fraction of a fraction of a second sooner moving opposed to just watching the whole ball and and maybe missing the top move maybe a fraction of a second later. Those little things will matter. On top of it, too, by focusing on the top top half of the ball, Mm -hmm. I'm now in my head recalibrating where I want to hit the ball. So if by focusing on the whole ball or the middle of the ball, I'm underneath, I'm looking at the top of the ball. Now my bat's going to be on a little bit of a better plane or a little bit of a better trajectory to make contact with that ball. And it's it's again, it's something that if you practice this off of regular front toss, the ball would probably be like a little wide drive or like a ground ball. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't want to hit balls like that. However, if you're facing, if you're prepping for someone like that in a game, that's probably what you need to practice in order to have the calibration of your bat click off of those really difficult pitchers. And how does lo- guessing a location tie into all of that facing that tough pitcher? Uh, yeah, is it, I- are you looking at trends? What are you looking at when it comes to location? So, you know what, this is something that like, I really followed um, what my coach's scouting reports would be. But as I got older in my junior and senior years, I would draw um, little strike zones and I would just watch the opposing pitcher in previous film. And I would say, and I would just put an an X where it was a strike and a circle where it was a ball. And I was just watching, watching, watching. And then, you know, I'd mark if it was a lefty, mark if it was a righty. And then all of a sudden you get to a point where you, you do that about 10 times and you're like, oh, hang on one second this X is showing up a lot. I'm seeing this X show up a ton. And yeah. now I can start to get my approach where I'm saying this, this pitch, this is the one I'm looking for. This is the one she's throwing. Um, and you're just trying to look for those trends. It's even the best of the best pitchers have tendencies. And if we can kind of be a little bit a step ahead or expecting those tendencies, we can now visualize that we can now say, okay, I'm visualizing this one spot. I'm visualizing top half of the ball. I'm visualizing crushing this ball into the opposite field gap, whatever it may be. Um, And then again, you're, you're just, you're giving yourself a much better chance of success than if you didn't do any of those things before. Yeah. You were creating um, spray charts and heat maps before it was cool. Mm. Pretty much. I think so. (laughs) Right. 
And that's that's a lot of, but that's an professional approach that hitters take now. Looking, and that's kind of like a heat map. Looking at that, looking at that type mm-hmm. of heat map, and being able to formulate a pro an approach through that. And and you did it way back when, and you're probably st- obviously still doing it with your with your kids now and the the adults that you coach. Um, when it comes to when you're facing that that ace pitcher, when you're facing that that really tough pitcher out there. Do you ever change? How much do you change mechanically if you if need be, or do you just kind of change things mentally, but not just rely more so on your mechanics? And you don't want to think too much up there at the plate. Yeah, and I think that's a great question because I think so many times uh, I think people very much so under uh, it's underrated how difficult it would be to com- to completely change mechanics, and you can do yeah. tiny tweaks here and there. Um, actually, that was one of the things I was most impressed with Oklahoma hitters watching. Mm-hmm. Um, they would start with their front foot slightly open, just a little bit. And it's like a, a little cheat for their hips. And then I noticed their bat. They Instead of having their bat completely cocked towards the knob facing the catcher, they would, on a little bit of a faster pitcher, a pitcher that they were maybe a little late on, they would un, undo that just a little bit. You're sacrificing a little bit of power, but all of a sudden you have way more precision, right? You're going to be a little quicker to the ball. So... I look at that, and the first thing that tell, that tells me is this is not their first time doing this. They've practiced this. Not only have they practiced this in practice, they've probably practiced this in games the entire year leading up to moments like this. And I would presume there's probably two to three different adjustments that you could make as a hitter that would be in-game adjustments that are not going to derail your mechanics. Um, something like one to two inches of split grip, the opening of that front foot, maybe an opening of the stance. There's gonna It's going to be maybe different for each hitter, but... You don't need 10 different adjustments. You probably just need a couple that are going to help you um, either sit back in your swing if you're a little too early after a a slower junk ball pitcher or something that's going to get you a little quicker to the ball if you're feeling behind off of a little bit more intense speed pitcher. Yeah, and again, all of this goes back to having an approach, and it's the reason I'm thinking that you used to do those those charts that you did when when you're X's and O's, right, and you were trying to figure out a certain repertoire that that pitcher may have. It all goes back to when you're, when you're facing these tough pitchers, having that proper approach, by the way, follow us on social media at Jim Tara at coach underscore Cassie RB on Instagram at coach Cassie RB on Twitter. But I keep, I keep bringing that up about approach. And that's why there are heat maps. That's why there are those advanced analytical type numbers that helps you get that advantage over that really tough pitcher out there. That again, once they're on, it's, they're really tough to crack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know what? The other thing too, is there's no way to guarantee success, right? You can't sit here and be like, I'm going to do all of this and I'm going to be able to hit a pitcher. Best of the best, really okay. good pitching beats mm-hmm. really good hitting most of the time. Uh, so most of the time, really good pitching is going to beat really good hitting. And that's just a fact of our game, but it's, it's not saying, Hey, I'm going to only do this because I'm guaranteeing success. It's, I have all these resources available to me. Thank goodness for technology. Thank goodness for heat maps. Thank goodness for video. How much more video do we have on these pitchers? How much better video do we have on these pitchers? Let's utilize them and give ourselves the best chance of success. Um, You know, pitchers get better. Hitters have to catch up. Hitters get better. Pitchers then need you know, they, they push the envelope a little bit more. And so this constant push pull, utilizing technology, utilizing resources is what makes both of our games so much better than it was 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. So I'm, I'm wondering, I'm just curious as we wrap up today's episode, by the way, email us to your question, Jimbo podcast, 21 at gmail.com Jimbo podcast, 21 at gmail.com. And if you want to be a sponsor of the show, yep. Guess what you do. Email Jimbo Podcast 21 <laughs> at gmail.com. How much are these? Uh, so I'm you know, I'm wondering with you, you know, you get you as a coach, you get to see a lot. You get to see a lot of different things. You get to see a lot of different um, organizations, a lot of different college programs, and you hear it from your your students as well. What are, what kind of resources now are available to these collegiate athletes and to these professional athletes that they can properly utilize when they're facing these tough pitchers? So I think one is that that film, right? So it's not just your yeah. traditional film. Now you have um, film that allows you to zoom in on the hand. Like the quality of our film is so much better. You can zoom in on the hand. You can start to look, okay, <clears throat> excuse me, when she throws an off speed, this is her hand location versus when she throws a hard pitch. Next, um, 
I, I keep saying when reality is going to be such a huge tool for people moving forward. That is the virtual reality system. Uh, let's say you go and you watch, you're facing a pitcher coming up that has a really aggressive rise ball. Let me go put my goggles on set in a 72 mile an hour rise ball pitcher that occasionally throws low and outside pitches. And even if you're not taking the reps and you're just seeing it and then maybe having it aid you in visualizing your that's that's giving you one more step that you didn't have 10 years ago, five years ago, even. Mm -hmm. um, I also think, too, as technology starts to sink a little bit better where people are not just chasing max velocity, max speed um, on their on their bat, let's say. And, and I have to assume there are programs doing this, but maybe just not as vocal because I haven't I haven't heard about it as much. But for instance, you're facing, you know, Kat Sandercott faced off against Jordy Ball in the Women's College World Series, right? Mm -hmm. Kat Sandercock has a certain type of spin. And as Oklahoma hitters, they may know, listen, we the pitch that we are sitting on and that we're looking at requires this type of bat plane in order to be successful. So when we go to BP to warm up before the game, we're going to put our blast, we're going to put our centers, we're going to do whatever we got to do. And, and then this is all we're working on is achieving this particular bat plane. Even during your warmups, even during your one-handed swings, even during your extension holds, whatever that may be, this is the bat plane we're going for. So I could so see technology already being there within certain organizations that, you know, maybe don't broadcast that as much. Um, but it's just, I think it's very impressive what we can have at our fingertips for, for hitters in the future and for right now. All right. So we, as we wrap up today's show, episode 42, Facing a Challenging Pitcher. <laughs> What would be the best advice you would give for any hitter out there when they're about to face a tough pitcher? Which, by the way, and this this has to be noted, that anytime you get to the Division One level, at a high level, playing in the ACC, the SEC, you're going to be facing a tough pitcher every single game. So take oh, our yeah. advice and what we're giving out today <laughs> as value, and you please use it. Because you're, as you get higher and higher and higher in the game of softball, in the game of baseball, you're going to be facing a tough pitcher pretty much every day. Um, I would I would have to go back to film. I think visualization is one of the most powerful tools on the planet. And yeah. the more film you can get underneath your belt, granted, you don't need to sit there and go three hours of film. And some of you might say, I can't find video of this person. Yes, you can. Social media exists. Okay. YouTube exists. Google the crap out of this person's name. Yeah. And you're going to find something. You're going to even if you can just look at their delivery and you can be like, OK, that delivery boom, I'm putting it in my brain for my visualization when I'm going to go hit off a tee later. It, it is just so powerful to have your mind work for you like that. Um, and so even at, at the very least, find some type of video, study that video, practice your timing off of that, and you're going to be so far ahead. You're going to you're gonna essentially have like two, three, four at-bats underneath your belt before you're getting into your actual first at-bat. Yeah, I think it's a visualization. I think it's one of, the, like you said, one of the most powerful tools in all of sports. All right, next week we will be diving into, I forget what the topic is next week, actually. I forgot to write it down. Uh, She's Cass is prepared. She's got it all pulled up, ready to go. Past common misconceptions about hitting. Oh, this will be good. Yeah. This is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know what? That was your idea, too. I'm looking forward yeah, yeah. to that one. <laughs> Oh man, there, and there's some there's some really good ones that are mainstream that aren't that you would think are more like professional type type um, type misconceptions that are are indeed that they're a complete misconception and completely mm. wrong. But then again, you know, who are we to say, right? Yes, we'll discuss, it's things we'll that were once we... previously accepted as concrete truths that now mm -hmm. have a little bit more depth depth That's throughout, right. perhaps. All right, so episode 43 next week. Thank you for joining us and listening. And be sure to subscribe. Leave a review, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, and on YouTube, Softball Strength Academy YouTube page to watch the show.